Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the Standing Committee on ed uh, Education and Economic Growth. My name is uh, Zach Bell, the Chair. Uh, it's Friday, October 8th at 10 in the morning. Uh, we thank uh, everyone for uh, tuning in. Uh, we also thank the media for being here and we do want to uh, welcome all of our uh, members. Uh, so today we have Stephen Howard, we have Trish Altes, we have Hal Perry and filling in for Minister Hudson we have Corey Deagle and also for Gordon McNeely we have Sonny Glant. So um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, first of all, can I get an adoption of the agenda? Stephen Howard, so move, thank you very much. So today we're gonna to be receiving a briefing on bullying and harassment in the school system. We have the Peers Alliance uh, here today. So what I might get you both to do, if it's all right, is maybe say your name and your position with Peers Alliance or your title uh, for Hansard, and then uh, after that we will probably jump right into your presentation. So we'll start here. Sounds great, my name is Vanessa Bradley and I am the Youth Program Coordinator at Peers Alliance. I'm uh, Scott Allen, and I'm also the Youth Program Coordinator at Peers Alliance. Perfect. So what we'll do is we'll let our presenters uh, present, and then after that we'll uh, open it up the floor for uh, questions or discussion, okay? Sound good? All right, so if you're ready, take it away. Yeah, absolutely. So. As I said, my name is Vanessa, um, and we're here to talk about bullying and discrimination in the school system on Prince Edward Island. Before I dove into creating this presentation, we actually asked our Queer Youth Collective about their experiences with bullying and harassment in schools. So here are a few of the things they said. I've been bullied for my whole life for something I can't control. I get called slurs walking in the halls, and it's worse outside when there's no teachers. It's something no one should go through. I came out two years ago and had a couple people going around telling everyone I was faking being transgender and to use she, her pronouns for me. This destroyed my grade 10 year because I'd finally gotten my name changed in school, but also had the courage to come out. It really hurt the lengths they, they went to make me miserable. Teachers in schools, especially older ones, seem to have a hard time using the correct pronouns. I've had to help tell my homeroom teacher four times, a classmate told her once, and the counselor in school administration told her once for her to get them right. I've also seen other classes' teachers <coughs> messing up the correct pronouns with other trans students. Gym class is a disaster for every queer student. I do not understand why it is mandatory. Is there a way to make gender neutral changing rooms without having to ask a teacher? A majority of trans students don't change at all if a neutral option isn't given. One youth stated that they gave their teacher a note with their new name and pronouns, and the teacher rolled her eyes and said, I'm not doing any of this until an adult tells me I have to. So bullying, harassment, and discrimination go far beyond student-to-student -student interactions. If you, government, and schools want these problems to be changed or addressed in a meaningful way, the people in power need to look at themselves and change how we address these issues. I want to note that as I asked students and educators for their input on this presentation, Multiple folks pointed out that there has really only been a real focus on change in the last year or so. Um, and we are really glad that there's finally a focus on how we can shift bullying and harassment in schools and ignite real change. And I want to focus on the gender diversity guidelines. We encourage everyone to familiarize yourself if you haven't already with the gender diversity guidelines recently established. Uh, the guidelines are a first step toward enabling inclusion and a fair learning environment for sexual and gender minorities, but the guidelines are not enough. There is currently nothing mandating teachers or administrators enact these guidelines. Because the guidelines aren't policy, guidelines alone cannot effectively protect students' rights to sexual and gender identity or fair treatment by peers, students, or school administration. Where informed goodwill is lacking among school administrators, 2S LGBTQ plus students face a dehumanizing learning environment. The policy that does exist is public school branches safe and caring learning environments operational procedure. This policy only addresses discrimination in passing and without consideration of the complexities of hate-based bullying. Research shows that it is far more effective to have specific policy against identity-based bullying and violence. And in order for the spirit of the guidelines to be effective, the implementation should include practical action items that can actually be reported upon. Teachers should be supported to create inclusive classrooms, administrators should be supported to create inclusive schools, and decision makers should ensure an inclusive curriculum, policies, and political and cultural climate. Pushback against diverse gender identities and sexuality continues to exist at all levels of the school system. There needs to be clearly identified safe people in each school island-wide. Um, to whom students and staff can report discriminatory practices, harassment, bullying, or assault. 
Equalizing the capacity to respond in such instances is important, as youth have also identified wide discrepancies between urban and rural schools. And I want to draw, to take everyone's attention to the East Wiltshire report. Um, the situation brought to light at East Wiltshire Intermediate School has received a great deal of media attention. Uh, the, independent the independent consultant's report revealed a chilling reality, which is that adults in our community are perpetuating and encouraging homophobic bullying in our school system. The actions of parents encouraging anti 2 LGBTQ plus sentiment among their children reveal that homophobic and transphobic bullying in schools is an extension of a broader cultural problem in our province. Government action is needed to address the subcultures of hate in PEI communities. Ensuring safe and inclusive communities is vital for the long-term retention, health, mental health, and success of PEI youth. And while research data is not available, it is anecdotally evident that there are ballooning numbers of youth coming out as 2 LGBTQ+, while in the public school system compared to 10 years ago. Uh, unfortunately, the consultant's report on the events at East Wiltshire in June of 2021 did reveal that teachers do not feel like they have the skills, training, or support to address homophobic, transphobic, or racist discrimination and harassment. Training for teachers and administrators island-wide is needed to address this, this knowledge gap. So in addition to asking some of the youth their experience, we also asked what they want to see addressed. Um, they said, I believe LGBTQ plus topics need to be discussed more in classrooms, especially at a young age to avoid this discrimination. Have at least a lesson or two to discuss some history and the correct terms. Teachers need to have more discussions about pronouns and gender. I've been told that in my school they had a meeting discussing this and none of the teachers knew anything. Improve education about queer issues in rural schools. When I switched from a rural school to an urban school, there was a notable difference in the sex ed program, as well as the health class in general. I don't think an urban school could have gotten away with what my rural school did, which was separating classes into boys and girls groups, not acknowledging that trans people exist, and only having same-sex relationships mentioned in the boys class. This one's for the people in charge. Your anti-bullying campaigns don't work. No amount of bucket filling prevented people from mocking me for being autistic in elementary school. None of those posters about girl power stopped my bullies in middle school from making sexual jokes about me because I happened to be in the same room as them. And not one assembly prevented my friends in high school from homophobic harassment. You actually have to do something instead of relying on the kids to stop it themselves. No more don't be a bystander nonsense while you pretend your hardest not to be the very bystander you condemn. I also think schools should actually punish students who are homophobic and transphobic. In every school I went to, there's been no punishment to those bullying members of the LGBTQ community. It's discouraging to have teachers know of the situation and do nothing. In my opinion, there's no justice. And we believe that a broader social conversation needs to be had about addressing discrimination, hate, and radicalization in the province beyond the school system. The atmospheres of bullying and harassment in schools has strong roots in our community, as I mentioned earlier. The homophobic firebombing of a disabled gay couple in Little Pond PEI still haunts LGBTQ community to this day, a decade later. Uh, despite increasing numbers of municipalities willing to raise pride flags, there remains a religious and political undercurrent of intolerance. There are far too many in the community who are opposed to fundamental human rights for 2S LGBTQ plus students. Teachers and administrators have exhibited a fear of parental backlash when they engage in inclusive education or accommodations for gender minority students. Educators shouldn't be afraid to include diverse gender and sexualities in their teaching material because of how a parent might react. The Department of Education and Public Schools branch, branch needs to have a clear policy that enshrines human rights for sexual and gender minorities with the understanding that these rights override parental preferences that would constrain these rights or access to basic knowledge of the 2S LGBTQ plus community. Policies and action items can support teachers and administrators when parents or caregivers express opposition to rights-based education. We recommend a clear and firm statement to be provided for educators, parents, and caregivers, or even staff, who still express opposition to sexual and gender diversity in PEI schools. Certainly, anti 2 LGBTQ plus harassment and violence in schools is a microcosm of our broader political realities. 
However, the school system is an area where meaningful interventions and changes can be made. Compared to anti 2 LGBTQ plus religious gatherings and fringe political movements, the public school system can go beyond guidelines and implement policies and procedures to support safe and inclusive learning environments for 2 LGBTQ plus and other marginalized students. In EGAL, Canada's Still in Every Class in Every School report from 2021, students answered what they wanted teachers to know about supporting 2 LGBTQ plus people. And they said that they want teachers to understand why silence around 2S LGBTQ plus topics is harmful, to stop making assumptions about their gender and or sexual identities, to use the correct pronouns for them, to include 2S LGBTQ people in classroom examples, to appreciate the importance of teacher support, and to acknowledge the barriers that many of them face. What they all have in common is that 2S LGBTQ students need educators to explicitly and visibly support, respect, include, and validate them, all of which is what every student in every school wants and is entitled to expect. So in the written presentation in front of you, I have included some of the recommendations that I mentioned, um, just kind of laid out at the bottom there. And if you have any questions, I believe now's the time. Okay, perfect. Um, are there any questions from uh, the committee? We'll start with uh, Trish. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, and thank you so much for this, for this presentation. Um, and Vanessa, I, I think um, it's, it's so important um, to bring the, um, the perspective of, of youth uh, to this committee. And uh, I thank you for, for sharing um, the quotes from the Peer uh, Queer Youth Collective uh, uh, with us. We can really get a sense of what their experience has been. Um, I want to go back to something that you mentioned here um, about uh, the, the idea of identifying safe people in each school um, that youth know that they could go to and, and share uh, if they've had uh, or seen uh, discrimination or harassment um, in the school. And I wondered if you could elaborate a bit on, on how schools can, can do this and, and, uh, um, and sort of yeah, explain how that process would work. Absolutely. Um, so the idea behind this is that there are two to three progress or diversity champions at each school. And these people would be trained and have support and have that scaffolding that, that teachers have explicitly expressed that they don't have to address some of these issues of harassment and bullying, both for racially motivated bullying as well as gender identity based bullying. Um, so it would be a way to put that empowerment back into the school and to create that scaffolding so that these progress or diversity champions can be a resource while also creating that scaffolding for other teachers to then be able to address these issues themselves. Perfect. And just before we go on, if you did want to add anything, Scott, by all means, <laughs> feel free, okay? Um, Trish? Um, you know, I'm going to let others uh, ask uh, questions as well. You can come back to me. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Steven? Thank you, Jerry. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess where I'll start with is um, uh, I've been doing a lot of thinking about bullying and the, the uh, safe, oh, sorry, what's it called, safe and caring lear learning environments uh, guidelines that we have out there. But the, as you mentioned, they're, they're not policy. Uh, I don't see in your recommendations that a change over from that from guidelines to policy is that something you guys would uh, be supportive of is having the safe and yes could you respond yes absolutely I, we would recommend that the guidelines be if not become policy have a have a policy behind the guidelines that supports them yeah. Steven thank you chair um, I had a meeting with the Child and Youth uh, Advisory Committee, and uh, one of the asks uh, uh, from the, the, that, that advisory committee was to increase the, uh, the awareness of teach teachers themselves need training. So coming from the youth, uh, it, it indicated that there was training needed for the teachers, and we've received a fair amount of feedback as well uh, to this committee uh, indicate from teacher bodies and things like that that uh, indicate that they would like more training in this regard as well. What are the barriers to acquiring that training for teachers? Uh, what's standing in the way of our system right now providing that training? Do you want to start that? Uh, a large portion is the funding. 
um, to have people come in and give training to the teachers. Like Vanessa and I do come in to the schools and do presentations, but these presentations aren't mandatory. They're, they're voluntary teachers who do just want to come in and learn more by themselves. They don't have any actual like uh, motivation from the administration to actually have to be there whatsoever. Steven? So once again, we go back to policy rather than a guideline, essentially. We need a policy to make sure that it's part of the curriculum, and then we need to fund it. Yeah, that's exactly what needs to happen. Stephen? Yeah. Uh, I heard you mention that the, the, the statistics, let's call them, of uh, the, the amount of 2SLGBTQIA plus coming out in our school system is increasing. But I bet you we have no idea what the full scope of that is, because we don't really have any metrics or anything like that to go on. And um, related to bullying, I, I see you have an evaluation process and su success indicators and whatnot, and, and I'm really interested in that. Um, Trish got into it a little bit here, but I would like to hear more about how you might be able to go about gathering the data itself uh, about what kind of bullying might be happening and where, and would you see any kind of privacy concerns with uh, people submitting these kinds of reports, and it, it, are there concerns in that regard? Yeah, there are always concerns about privacy when you're dealing with other people's children. Um, and in a lot of spaces, you do need that parental consent. Um, I know that the surveys that we do through the PI Career Youth Collective, when we do something like this, I offer that it, it is anonymous and they don't need to share their names or anything else with me. Um, and that allows, I think, that, that anonymity allows for more truthful responses. I think that trying to get information like that, it can be very, very difficult because not everyone is going to be open or honest about their bullying experiences. Pe some, a lot of youth don't know that they're, how they identify yet. They're, they're learning, they're growing, they're figuring themselves out. Um, what else from the question am I missing? Steven? Yeah, just, uh, well, to your point of uh, people not being very forthcoming, sometimes uh, you, when you're doing having a survey, it might be uh, the teacher or the principal or the guidance counselor, someone's there with you uh, asking for this information. And a lot of people that are being bullied don't trust the system that they're within themselves and feel like they might be being failed by the system that's asking them for this information. Um, so do you have any suggestions on how we might be able to get around that, get this information? Because I'm not sure how we'd be able to measure success without knowing what's going on first. So I'd really like to find a way to find out the real picture of things so that we can continuously do that and measure success of actions we take. I can kind of maybe touch on that, um, creating more safe spaces for these students in schools like GSAs um, would play a huge part in, in helping these students come forward and be who they are and, and give us that truthful data that we're kind of looking for. Um, as of now, there's not a, a GSA in every school. There's, uh, we have some principals reaching out to us to, to figure out how to start one or, or um, how to get that ball rolling or how to create that space and we're, we're at, at Peers Alliance more than willing to help, um, help them in that, go down that road and, and creating those spaces but um, I think not having that space is a huge hindrance to, to getting that data that you're kind of looking for. Yeah, absolutely agree with what Scott said and I'll add to that in that um, with with youth, if you if there is even an opportunity for a safe space like a GSA, even if they don't go to it, but they know that it exists, that allows for a different level of, I would say, comfort almost, because they know that there are people who have their backs. And a lot of times it's one administrator or teacher who's really, really passionate. But if they're, the, the more this kind of thing is talked about, the more teachers come out in support, the more teachers get trained, the more I think that we'll be able to actually get research and we'll actually be able to get that data because we'll have a different kind of access to it with students slowly but surely starting to feel more comfortable in offering their experiences to us. Steven? I'm fine for now, Chair, thank you. Trish? 
Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so something uh, that, that you mentioned in your presentation, it came up in, in one of the quotes that made me think of uh, something that was also brought up when Pride PEI came to present would be um, um, the uh, looking at our curriculum um, in in all areas, so not just in in health, but you know in 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 uh, in everything that's being taught to take a look at you know are there examples of two S L B L G B T Q plus uh, people that are, are are talked about right um, and and the ways that that we frame um, you know different different issues and, and things that the, the children and youth are learning. So I'm wondering um, if in your discussions with the public schools branch, if a review uh, of curriculum uh, to, to look at these sorts of things is something that has, has come up and what the response has been. Scott and I are fairly new to the position. We actually haven't had many meetings with the public schools branch yet, but I would hope that that would absolutely be the case going forward. Trish? Yeah, and you know, uh, as you're, you're new to this position as well, you, uh, you may not know this, but I, I'm wondering about you know if there are examples in, in other provinces uh, where they've they've done this well, or where there's you know they've 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 uh, in, have a much more inclusive uh, curriculum perhaps than we do. Um, yes, I know that there are a couple of provinces who we who we looked at as kind of like a baseline. I believe that is it Alberta is one actually that has a great policy. Um, and that's where some of our guidelines came from when we were consulting with the public schools branch on those guidelines. And I think there are some more, there, there are others as well, as well as some in the United States that have better gender diversity policies than we do here in PEI. Yeah. Trish? Thank you. So it sounds like this is, you know, really something that we need to approach from many different levels, right? So, you know, policy, uh, it needs to be policy and not guidelines when it comes to uh, issues of uh, harassment and discrimination, certainly. Um, but also looking at, you know, what can we do to, uh, to support all children and youth to, uh, to be more um, aware and, and inclusive and, um, and open to, to all different, you know, types, all different genders, all different sexual identities and, and sort of, uh, you know, how do we uh, incorporate that throughout? And I think, as you mentioned, training for teachers as well. So, um, you know, that's one of the message that, messages that I'm hearing here, that it's not, there's not sort of one thing and you've checked the box, we did the thing, it's, it's done. It's all, how can we really make, um, you know, uh, make inclusion and, um, uh, and uh, you know, it, it th how do we incorporate that throughout? So that's sort of one of the things I'm hearing. Would that be sort of, am, am I correct in, in understanding um, that? Yeah, hundred um, percent. As one of the quotes even pointed out was, no amount of posters or assemblies are going to stop this. We can preach at the kids all day long and put up all these fun posters all day long, but they're not really going to do anything. It's having the backbone from the teachers that uh, the policies that kind of mandate what and how they treat these situations. It's having the safe spaces in schools. It's having the teachers educated in these things. It's it's a whole gamut of things. It's it's not just one checkbox. You are very correct in that matter. Yeah, and it's also just uh, that broader social conversation that I mentioned in the presentation as well. Is it's uh, it's community work. It isn't just work in the schools. Trish, I'll chair. Thank you, Sonny. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, one of the recommendations was for the schools to partner with community groups such as yourselves, and you had indicated that some principals reached out to you and that you're, you're new. Has the public school branch reached out to your organization for any input or any recommendations that you could bring forward? Um, not currently, but that's because we're we're new, so we're still learning. And I um, I will be in touch with them, and we're planning to be in touch at the end of the month to discuss further. And we are working with other community organizations as well, uh, with going into schools and some other work that's being done in schools. Sonny? I know you touched on it about better education. Is there anything else you could share with us that could be more, could be better for, in the school system for ways they can deal with this? Like the teachers at being educated or? <laughs> um, other thoughts for dealing with bullying and harassment in schools? Is that what you're asking? Um, there's a lot of research out there 
for what bullying, like how to address bullying and harassment in schools. And I think something that the youth commented on a lot that I think is really important is that there's no, um, there's no policy that says if you call someone a slur, that's different from you just calling someone an a-hole. Those are two separate things, right? There's a different weight behind one than the other, but they're punished the same way. And so I think that a lot of, something that the youth say a lot is that there's no punishment for this bullying and this harassment in schools. It's just kind of a slap on the wrist, don't do that. And I think that creating a, a system or a policy that allows for, because I know that there's a policy for what happens when someone is bullied, what happens with this, you know, what are the repercussions and what does the school system do? And doing things like suspending a student doesn't actually help anything, especially if, as mentioned in the report, some of that behavior is coming from home. And so they're not actually learning anything, you're just sending them home to keep getting more of the same. And so I think that creating a different disciplinary system, like a progressive discipline model in schools for these kind of, for these occurrences would be really important. Sonny? That's good for now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Steven? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I talked, spoke about the child and youth advocate uh, a little bit earlier there. Do you guys deal with, uh, I mean, everybody has the right to feel safe in school, and uh, the child and youth advocate deals with uh, the rights of uh, children. And uh, you mentioned gym class and uh, the members of your community not feeling comfortable at all with gym class whatsoever. So th they don't really feel safe in that environment. And I'm just wondering, have you consulted with the child and youth advocate to bring him into this conversation? Not at this time, no. We haven't, we haven't had any, any communication with the child and youth advocate yet. We are hoping to. Stephen? Thank you, Chair. Um, y you mentioned a need for uh, instead of a responsive approach, a proactive approach. And we talked about data once already here, but in, in, without having some, uh, I, wouldn't, I don't think you'd ever be able to get real-time data without uh, tracking every single student on stop, and we'd get into all sorts of issues there. But do you see any methods that we could use, whether it's uh, through a survey or whether it's through technology or whether it's through a process within a school that we could more more efficiently gather that, that information about what's happening, perhaps not safe in a classroom, perhaps not safe in a change room, perhaps not safe in a hallway. Um, do you see any methods to more accurately gather information and respond to it proactively as opposed to responding to it after things have come to a culmination? Yeah, um, as I mentioned before, creating those safe spaces is, is absolutely paramount so those children can come to us um, so those youth can come to us and, and, uh, and express those experiences to us. Um, without those safe spaces, these youth don't feel like they can come or talk to any teachers or, or anyone and feel safe about it. Um, creating those spaces and identifying those teachers that are uh, very open and welcoming um, and creating those safe spaces are huge for a lot of these students. They don't, they don't necessarily know which teachers are supportive or not. So. Yeah, and I do think there's something to be said for creating and putting into place that progressive discipline model, even if there isn't currently that research data available, because right now you have a lot of youth saying that there is absolutely no justice in schools for when they are bullied or harassed. And so right now you have a, we have um, a system that doesn't support these youth, and so they, they're not going to come talk to an adult unless they have a relationship, they know they can trust that adult. And that isn't always the case, even if there are adults, teacher, administrative advocates in the schools. So if there's not a, a, a policy and a system to back them up, it's just kind of, they feel like they're screaming into the void. And that's, it makes it difficult. Steven? Thank you, Chair. Uh, you mentioned safe spaces, of course, there, but uh, would you include digital, uh, like, uh, in person? I, I, I imagine it being much more difficult to deal in person with these kinds of issues when you're first trying to seek help. And uh, I was just speaking with uh, someone that's in the education system recently, and they were talking about 
just the fear of speaking out in class, not, not about bullying at all, but just to ask a question. He used to hear almost no questions, and now that they've gone to online learning where, where students can submit questions digitally, he's getting about 20 questions every time he asks that question. So just the change there indicates to me that you'd be, people would be a lot more forthcoming and feel a lot safer in that digital environment. And do you guys have an opinion on that, being able to reach out to these known safe um, um, supporters within the school digitally as well? Yeah, we, uh, we actually, with our Queer Youth Collective, we have a channel on Discord where the youth can all, um, Discord is a chat service, um, <laughs> just for the record, um, where we do have moderators on there, but it generally allows the, the youth to express themselves um, very freely and uh, in, a, in, a, in a safe space with, with the other youth that are in that channel as well. Um, we can, we, we have it set to like, invite only so it's not just everyone can pile in um, but I find that we do have a lot more openness on the discord channel than we do in the queer youth um, collective sometimes for sure there's a lot more talking there's a lot more openness from the youth yeah and I will say that that's actually how I got a lot of these quotes is I created a survey and I asked them to share their their experiences with me and a lot of them were very open to doing so because it's again, it's an anonymous platform and they feel comfortable, they know me a little bit. And I think that, that having that online, and COVID has really created an opportunity, I think, because the Discord did come out of COVID and not being able to meet in person. And so it allows for um, community on a different level and a community outside of that, of youth group. When youth group's not going on, they still have that community. So I think that the online platforms are really important. Steven? Thank you. Uh, are you satisfied with the public school branch's uh, handling of the East Wilshire incident? I, uh, I don't think we really need to comment on that right now. Mm -hmm. Stephen? Fair enough. How can Island Schools do a better job of being proactive, uh, preventing the incidents of dis discrimination? Uh, we've got into it a little bit here now, but with the tools they have right now, how could they be doing a better job? With the tools they have now, how can the public school branch specifically do a better job? Um, well, I know that they, they do have the independent consultant that they're working with, um, so I think that that's a really, really great start. I think that there, there needs to be more training, more support, more, more um, actionable items like creating policy, um, establishing the diversity champions or progress champions, safe people at each school. Um, they do have a lot of resources, and I think that the, the, the want to change is there now. I do think after the East Wiltshire incident, it brought a lot of things to light that I think were very important for the public and for teachers as well to see within their school systems. So I think that they have, they have the resources and they have the ability. So we're hoping that they take some of our recommendations and enact them. Steven? Right for me, Chair, thanks. Hal? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for coming in today for the presentation. Um, I, most of my questions have been answered already, but uh, you talked a little bit about what your current um, um, work was with, the, with, with some of the schools or with the system, I guess, in addressing the situations of bullying and harassment. And you talked about um, making some presentations to schools, but the attendance wasn't mandatory. Who initiated that presentation? Was it your organization or was it the schools reaching out to you? Um, it would be the schools reaching out to us. So they reach out to us and they request. We also have teachers who request that we come into their classrooms. So we have presentations for all of the, all grade levels as well. Um, and it really is Previously, I know there was only one person in the youth program coordinator position, and it was just a lot of work. So I was really thrilled we were able to bring Scott on board. So there's two of us now, and we're really hoping to, we're hoping to also be able to start to reach out to those schools as well as letting them come to us if they are looking for something. Um, we, we send out um, a package every year in accordance <laughs> with the public schools branch, and it just lets everyone know about the Queer Youth Collective um, and also about the educational sessions that we do offer. Hal? Thank you. Um, just to expand a little bit on what Sonia had mentioned earlier about working with the public school board and the Department of Education, one of the recommendations that came out of the report um, was uh, 
that the school should partner with organizations such as uh, Peers Alliance uh, to you know, provide education to the department and, and to the public school board. Um, about exploring that partnership, have they reached out to you? Not as of yet. Okay. Hal? If they did reach out to you for such a partnership, how do you think that would look? I mean, um, I'm not sure yet, but ideally I think it would look like us being able to talk to teachers in a situation where it's a, profes like it, it's a professional development day and they're, they're all there. Um, instead of having non-mandated trainings that people who want to go come to, which is great because you can still really enact change that way, but I think that having more mandatory trainings, more resources that could be built through a partnership with the public schools branch would be great. And also just continuing talk about guidelines and policy. Al? Agree. Well, let's hope that happens. Huh? Thank you, Chair. Trish? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just one more quick question. So you've, uh, you've shared a bit about the PEI uh, Queer Youth Collective and uh, the Discord server and that you also meet in person. And I'm just thinking about, you know, uh, parents or youth who might be, you know, watching this committee or, or you know, looking back to see, you know, uh, what, what was said and what they could learn uh, for their own experiences. Uh, it would be, I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit more about how people can connect with the Queer Youth Collective and, and how that works. Uh, yeah, the Queer Youth Collective, um, we have two uh, groups that meet on Tuesdays, one in Charlottetown and one in Summerside. Summerside meets the first and third Tuesday of every month at the um, Youth Engagement Centre in Summerside. And then we have the Charlottetown one uh, just across the street at Murphy's. We meet every second and fourth Tuesday of every month. Um, and it's drop-in, uh, there's no registration required. Uh, there's snacks provided. We we have a, a lightly structured uh, night with activities, and um, it's a it's a great time and safe space for for any youth right now. Yeah, yeah and I would also say, I would say that the 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 goal of PI Queer Youth Collective. I mean, there are many, but really the big one is to create that peer relationship and that peer support that a lot of queer youth are lacking in schools. And so I think that the PI Queer Youth Collective really allows them to connect with their peers, to meet people outside of their schools, and to have that sense of community that also can then translate onto the Discord platform when they can't make the Tuesday night or they want to talk on a Wednesday. So I think that that's really, we're really focusing on that that the, the socialness and the support of that group. And we also are hoping to um, offer committees again this year, which was something we had that had to briefly go away during COVID, but committees on education. There was a youth committee, I believe it was 2019, that did a gender neutral washroom campaign. And there was also um, an event committee and they did queer prom in 2019. So we're hoping to bring those back this year as well as a chance for queer youth to really be able to take on leadership roles within, within the community. Trish? Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Are there any, Corey? Uh, thanks, Scott, and thank you, thank you, Vanessa, for coming in today. And actually, it was Hal's question on being uh, the some of the training being kind of combined with a. I think actually you might have mentioned it, Vanessa, with a professional development day. I thought it was a, a good idea. Uh, something that well, I think there I think there's one today actually a professional development day. So, um, and forgive me, but I, you had mentioned Vanessa that the peers is it a relatively new group? You said this. The Peers Alliance, is that? Um, right. Peers Alliance is not new. Peers Alliance, Scott and I are both new to the position. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Position. yeah. Um, and do you, re again, excuse my ignorance, but do, you, do you receive funding from government at all? Is it? Yes, we receive funding from uh, the Department of Health and Wellness, and um, United Way actually funds our Queer Youth Collective. The Queer Youth Collective started in 2016 just in Charlottetown, and since then we've expanded into Summerside um, and in Tignish a little bit as well. Corey? Yeah, just because you had mentioned that on your own it was difficult to, to try and do all this stuff, and that, that you have Scott, it's a little easier. So is that, do you get more funding, or is the funding stay the same, or how do, how do you, do, obviously everyone would love more funding, <laughs> of course, but 
Um, do you str does the group do you struggle right now with with the funding uh, that you do receive? I think the hardest part is that we want to offer accessible training and accessible workshops to the community, and <clears throat> with our funding, we're able to offer you know sliding scales for some <clears throat> folks. But it's hard when someone can't offer any compensation for the workshops that we do. Um, especially outside of schools, because we do do educational workshops for just organizations all over the island. Um, and so that can be tough. Um, we currently are, both Scott and my position are currently funded, but they are one year contracts just because of the nature of grant work and the nature of working in a nonprofit is, it's always kind of in flux. So we are constantly looking for new funding opportunities and we are also always taking donations. <laughs> Corey, good. any other questions from the committee? All right, I just have one quick question. Um, so just in the first part there from the Discord, uh, you had talked about digitally. Um, you mentioned uh, that we, uh, this is just quoting from uh, what you presented with us. We want to note that as we asked uh, students ed and educators for their input for this presentation, multiple folks pointed out that there has only really been a, a focus on change in the last year or so. Um, again, not kind of, trying to identify anyone, but it, was that more of a, a comment that was shared by the educators or more by the youth that had participated in this? Uh, both. This was from the youth, um, from, from one educator, and also from a lot of parents as well, because I did consult a couple of, of parents on this presentation. So a lot of the parents mentioned that they haven't felt like there was much of a focus on it, even until the East Wiltshire event happened okay and so I'm assuming when they say the real change that has been more in a positive or more in a negative I think in a in a positive way it's a push toward what do these guidelines mean how can we actually mandate that they be followed and you know I think also the independent consultants report and the recommendation that the recommendations that came out of it um, while I think they're I mean they're great recommendations but they, we all need to be doing more, especially the public schools branch, and I think that some folks in the community are finally seeing an opportunity for that change. Perfect. Okay. Um, are there any? Is there anything uh, that you do want to uh, say before we wrap up, or anything that you may have left out in your presentation, or our members uh, didn't ask? No, I think we're all set. Okay, perfect. Well, we do uh, want to thank you uh, both for coming in today. Um, you uh, highlighted a lot of uh, great things for us to uh, look at. Um, so at this point in time, we're uh, going to uh, say have a great uh, Friday, have a great weekend, and uh, we'll take a short break, and then we'll return with our uh, agenda. Thank you. Thank you. So we are back. Um, we call this a rookie mistake, uh, per se. Um, so where we will be continuing on with our agenda, but uh, we'll be moving into camera for the discussion of the committee's report to the Legislative Assembly. So for, uh, pardon? Uh, motion to go in camera. So moved by Stephen Howard. Thank you.
Thank you for uh, tuning in today.